Well, thank you very much, Jane. I feel quite flattered to come and give this talk. I'm just a little old guy up in Fort Collins, 70 miles north of here, and uh, working away in the trenches. I've been down in the meteorological trenches about 57, 58 years now, and uh, a lot of my critics say I haven't learned very much in that period, but I think I've learned something. I, I think maybe you all I'm going to show a lot of slides here, and uh, uh, I, I, you'll uh, understand I'm very reluctant to express my views when, uh, <laughs> when we go. But anyways, uh, I have a lot of slides here, and I hope you enjoy them. And um, I, my start out, my hypothesis is, when CO2 doubles, we're not going to see much global warming. You know, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, maybe most 0 0.5. And that uh, that warming would probably be more good for humanity than if it cooled. And then my other point uh, is that uh, uh, my recommendation is we should do nothing on this CO2 business. This is the biggest hoax I have ever heard in my life, and I've been watching it for. Uh, yeah, what a wonderful crowd this is. I've never been to one of these conferences, but seeing the talks today, this is the best conference I've ever been to. It's wonderful, wonderful. I have so many colleagues. I, I'm not alone. For many years, I was up there from uh, the time uh, uh, Jim Hansen gave his 1988 uh, testimony to Congress. I've been appalled that he would say this and the press would cover him so much and all that. And I've, I've been telling everyone I could that it, it's, it's, uh, it's just wrong. It's garbage. It's, uh, we shouldn't be uh, listening to him, but yet the influence he has had. And of course, one of the big villains is the mainstream media that has covered and given so much credence to these uh, human-induced global warmers. So, the politics, it's a big hoax, the whole thing in the world is coming in. The scientific objectivity has been suspended long ago, the IPCC can't be believed with what they're saying. And uh, this is what should have been, in my view. Yes, okay, there's a question. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, does CO2, humans putting it out, is it gonna affect the climate? That's a reasonable question, I don't mind that. So, the government should have handed out money to those who think that, and the modelers and so on, and also those that are skeptics. And they would have gone back and forth, argued back and forth, had meetings in the mountains without any media, and talked this out, and come out with a balanced view on it. It's a reasonable thing. But what happened? It all went one way. They bought their way to this. The tremendous funding, the media uh, going along with it, unrealistic alarmism, cap and trade. And out here were a few of us skeptics who say, it, it ain't so, but they didn't listen to us. I feel very honored to be here with the morning sessions with, um, I have a great hero here in Fred Singer who has been at it longer and fought harder than anybody else. And he, he's a national treasure. And the others, Mark Moreno did a great job. Willie Sun did a great job. Dave LaGates, I, I, that's what, when uh, Shane wrote me about this, I was, uh, I, I didn't know anything about this conference and uh, I, I, uh, but then you told me these people were coming, and I said, yeah, I'm coming too. Yeah, so anyways, what happened as a result of this? This is what's in the, the textbooks. You will get it, they, our kids are being brainwashed in college and all this. 
Two to four degrees warming of the tropical oceans. That hasn't e even happened in the Cretaceous period 60 million years ago. Great warming here. This is what's being said from CO2 warming, just doubling CO2. And I've done a, a relative study here. If you look, uh, don't mind the units, they're watts per square meter, but every day the atmosphere has condensation of about 148 units. It has re-evaporation of that condensation, about 70 units. Evaporation, condensation are about equal at 78 units. That happens every day. Now, CO2 has been building up over the last 150 years, 1.3 units. Now you think this little buildup, this occurs every day, a million times more energy condensing, evaporating, all this stuff, compared with a small little effect of CO2. When they say it doubles, we have 3.7 watts per square meter. That's what's gonna happen in the latter part of the 21st century. Now I like uh, much of this uh, alarmism has come from the global models. People believe models. And I like uh, Nikolai Teska's statement. Today scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments and they wander through equation through equation uh, after equation and eventually build a structure that has no relation to reality. That's what our climate models have. They have no relation to reality. Now, uh, Jane Nova from Australia has done this marvelous study of the money that has gone into climate research. This is just research. This doesn't include, uh, I, I'm told she says 77 billion, half of that or so is this has gone into straight research, into funding the modelers and everyone else that goes along with the modeling ride. By the way, there, if you don't go along with global warming and you're in the academic sphere, you have very difficult getting any funding because they're all living off <laughs> climate money. Money talks and you, um, for instance, if I go in and I criticize this, I want to study, uh, say I don't believe in global warming, I want to look at this and that and other factors that may be responsible for climate change, they'll reject it. I've been rejected many times and a lot of my colleagues have been rejected and they don't ask us. I've been around a long time. I made these real time hurricane forecasts I've been down in the trenches doing data work. You think I might be on the IPCC? They wouldn't touch me with a 100-foot pole. I would have never been contact. And a lot of my older colleagues who think like I have never been contact to be part of it because we let out very early, 20, 25 years ago, we didn't believe in all this. Anyways. Here's a, uh, a fellow from Australia, I don't know him, but I like what he says. Uh, the holy grail for most scientists is not truth, but research grants. And the global warming scare has produced a huge downpour of money for research. Any mystery why so many scientists claim to believe in global warming? Uh, you know, the, it's, uh, I'm not immune to this either. Earlier on in my career, they did these big, I've been in tropical meteorology and tropical storms, and we had these big field programs, and they cost a lot of money. And I was always sort of against them, talking against them. I said, look, just uh, let's study data that's already collected. It doesn't cost so much. Why go? have all the ships and planes and cost millions of dollars. They go collect all the data and then people look at it for a half a year or so and then another experiment's formed and they never 
fully look at the data. We never look at the collected data we have that costs so much less. Anyways, I wasn't going to get funded, so I reluctantly went along and joined. I was in a Bomex and a Gate and Toga and all these sort of things. I had to be because I needed the research money. I'm corruptible too. We all are. I, or most of us are. Maybe Fred Singer isn't, but uh, most of us are. Uh, anyways, I like what, uh, uh, what Joanne Nova said. Here's a meeting of the IPCC, and it said, hands up. Who thinks greenhouse gas have no effect, therefore uh, we all need new jobs? Anyone raising their hand? <laughs> of course not. Uh, now, I like Chris Moncton. He's a, a wonderful. He should come to one of your meetings if you can get him here. He is a marvelous speaker and was on uh, an advisor to Margaret Thatcher uh, a while ago. But uh, he said, nearly all your nation's scholars and scientists owe their primary livelihood to the involuntary generosity of the taxpayer. I'm going to go on. Uh, uh, there, uh, some of your rent-sinking scientific technological elite taking willful and shameful advantage of the taxpayers' largest and of the scientific ill literacy that is now widespread are mightily enriching themselves by misleading your Congress into appropriating disproportionately large sums to permit them to address the non-problem of anthropogenic global warming. I think that's what's happening. Now, it's more than that. It's more than research, because now they're going out with trading and stuff. We see the bankers and all these other things getting involved. And once they start making money, they're going to be for global warming, too. It's, uh, in my view, it's a giant cancer, a global cancer that's spreading on us that'll be very hard to kill. Reality, uh, objectivity, doesn't matter. It's money, it's how many people you can fool, and all these sorts of things. Now, what's the solution? The solution to it, at least, is kill the science. Be objective. How do we get objective? Who's the last people to call on to tell the truth on this? Are the meteorologists and climatologists. They're all on the take. You'll never get a, 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 a direct, honest answer from them because they know which side their butter's breaded or their <laughs> Bread is buttered on. <laughs> Anyways, you know what I mean. So what I feel, we need a whole pile. There are so many older, maybe retired, semi-retired scientists, engineers, geologists. We, I believe our government spending 77 billion on research could spend a little bit to organize a number of these study groups. Maybe I have six here, maybe we need 10 or 20 of them, of about 20, 25 people. You fund them for two or three months, they bring their families to a nice place, and they talk. They are, have no vested interest in this, but they are trained in objectivity and science, and let them debate. We could have pro and con, Global warming people go and talk to all of them, let them write reports. If this happened, I'm sure nearly all of them would give reports that this is grossly exaggerated and we, would, we should not start these draconian programs to reduce CO2. Uh, okay, that's the, that's the preface of my talk. Now I want to start. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what are GCMs? Oh, okay, general circulation models. The GCMs are, the, are these global models. 
The GCMs give way too much global warming. None of them should be taken seriously. And in my view, the deep ocean circulation changes are the primary driver for climate change. You see, one of the big problems we have is with the CO2 people is, well, I say, look, in the last century, the globe has warmed 0.7 degrees C or one degree Fahrenheit. What's the cause of this? If you don't have an answer, they shove in CO2 for you. That has to be it. CO2 goes up, the temperature goes up, they're obviously related. Well, they aren't, but it's, uh, you can make the case. So what's really going on? What is, why do the models get so much warming? Well, if you, there are two gr main greenhouse gases, water vapor, the dominant one, and CO2. If you double CO2 and keep everything the same, you warm the globe maybe one degree or a little less. Now what the models do, they increase CO2 and then they assume if CO2 increases, the globe warms a little bit. If it warms a little bit, it has a little more rain to balance that warming. And that extra water vapor in the upper troposphere blocks long wave radiation to space and they get two or three times the warming from that than directly comes from the CO2. Therefore, the models say two to five degrees centigrade warming. That's grossly beyond what nature's going to do, in my view. Now, the problem is, they, it came out of the Charney report, a famous meteorologist, Jewel Charney, who died in 82, but this was a 79 report where they said, look, there's no doubt water vapor. As the temperature gets greater, the ability of the air to hold water vapor goes up. This is the classiest Clapeyron uh, equation. So they say, when we get a little CO2, we get a little warming, the water vapor goes up, it blocks outgoing radiation, and the warming gets greater. The CO2 taps warming two or three times as much as the CO2 itself. That's the central issue, and that's been wrong all along. And a number of us, like Lindzen and other people, have been pointing this out. I've been pointing it out since 88, when uh, Hansen gave his talk to the Congress in the hot summer of 88. Anyways, this is one of the reasons for it. You see, if you get more clouds, they don't have their clouds right in the model. They have very simple cloud schemes and big grids that can't possibly handle the cumulonimbus clouds that are on a much smaller scale. And you get the mass goes up. What they don't have is the return flow. You see, if you get, get a cloud and it goes up, it takes mass with it, it rains out, but there's mass up there that sinks on the side. And the mass sinking on the side, the upper layers are very cold. They can't hold as much vapor. If you sink mass, you dry. So, so much of the upper troposphere gets dried. So the more rain, the bigger clouds you have, you often get more long wave to space. This is watts per square meter. This is the crucial flaw in the, or one of them, there's a few others in the global modeling work. When we look at the data on, uh, of course, this is people will criticize the uh, uh, NOAA reanalysis data, but when you look at this from 1950 to 2004, at the humidity, the vapor in the uh, upper middle troposphere, it's actually going down with time. It's not going up. All the models say it should be going up. It's not. Uh, so you can sort of say now, where do clouds occur? They occur, clouds and rain, in organized systems in various places around the globe. 
Now, with a greenhouse gas world, we'll probably, uh, uh, the CO2 will block a little energy to space and the surface will warm a little bit and we'll get more clouds. But where we'll get more clouds and rain is probably in areas where it's already raining, like these red areas. So there'll be a little more mass going up. And in the surrounding intermediate areas, there'll be a little more sinking and that sinking will dry and the middle level vapor won't go up, it'll slightly go down and we'll let more uh, energy to space and we won't see much warming. Now here's what Jim Hansen, in his 88 talk, his early model, here's what he did with a double CO2, he put in the upper troposphere 50% greater vapor. You see it was this cloud model, it stunk. And we, uh, we all knew it. Lindsay and I and other people knew it, and we talked about it. He had the relative humidity going up when all the evidence shows when you get more rain, the relative humidity in the middle and upper troposphere goes down. It's terrible. Then he wounds up as uh, Fred showed this morning, this tremendous warming in the tropics, seven degrees C. He had to because he blocked so much energy to space, it warmed so much. To get a balance, he had to warm the upper troposphere a lot so the sigma t to the fourth, the greater energy went out. This is ridiculous. This isn't going to happen. And as Fred showed and others have shown, it's not happening now. And here's the Hansen model. I'm, uh, you know, we got to get the data. He showed when he came out what the temperatures of a lot of American cities, how many days above uh, 90 and 100 we're going to see in 2010 and 2030. And I'm trying to get that data now. But anyways, the observations go like this. Various Hansen models go up like this. We're not making this. It's not going to happen. Anyways, the, all the other models do it the same thing. They all meet together, pat each other on the back. You're doing great work. Yes, this and that. I, know my, I do it a little different. I use a 0.67 for my coefficient rather than 6.4, you know. I mean, this is what they're doing. This is the UK Met Office. Tremendous warming in the upper troposphere. The NCAR model. Tremendous warming, uh, GFDL, the Princeton lab model warming. Now, as, uh, 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 as Willie Sun has, some, has a better slide than this, nevertheless, the models, when they get increased vapor in the lower layers, they immediately have it in the model in the upper layers, whereas the OBS show the correlation between the vapor changes in the lower troposphere and the upper troposphere are very, very weak. They just, these models just aren't realistic. So we've done a lot. I had a colleague that was coming to the dinner. I was trying to sneak him in here, but uh, I don't see him. So anyways, his name is Barry Swartz, and we've been working a lot with a reanalysis data and this new uh, International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project data, getting a lot with albedo and OLR, outgoing long wave or IR energy to space. And we find something new they don't talk about, no one talks about this, the albedo. You know, uh, people say if it rains a lot, of course, all this cloudiness is going to block uh, infrared radiation to space, which it does. But we find now, looking at a lot of data, that it's overcome by the albedo. The albedo with more cloudiness actually goes up. And these big cloud areas you actually get, if you look at the net radiation to space, it's more with rain, whereas the models have the opposite. In other words, is the water vapor feedback negative as the models have, or is it positive? We find it slightly positive. 
and it just knocks out all the model results. Uh, I won't go over all this, but in the net, changes for the tropics at least, overall now in the non-rain areas you have more IR out and less albedo. For the whole tropics, we have rain areas that goes a certain way, less re or, uh, uh, clear or partly cloudy areas that goes a certain way, but overall it slightly goes we just recently uh, nailed this down, that more rain in the uh, globe means a little more uh, uh, radiation to space. So that means if you have a little more rain, you can balance out extra things. Now here, I'm, don't get scared at this picture. I don't. This is the radiation balance of the tropics. I don't want you to uh, look at all this, but let's just look at some of the things. In the tropics, 30 north, we get about 399 of these units, watts per square meter. We have uh, long wave radiation uh, out of 274, albedo 105, these big things at the surface. We have solar energy roughly in of 215 units. IR coming from the atmosphere down of 402. IR going out of 459, 57 net out. We have evaporation, sensible heat. You don't have to look at all this. Look at this, these numbers and now ask yourself how much the CO2 go? The CO2 doubling the estimates are roughly about 3.7. Howard Hayden, where is he? Is that right, Howard? Is that about right? Okay, now the logarithmic, as Howard says, as you <laughs> double it again, it doesn't go up. Uh, it doesn't double, it goes up logarithmically less and less. So this is, I mean, look, 3.7 units with all these other units what does that mean? That means we can hide the 3.7, we're gonna block the space due to CO2. We can hide it in all this other stuff, and yeah, the rainfall may go up a little bit, the net IR will go up, the sensible heat will go up, but it'll be, you can handle it, and the net warming when we double CO2 is not gonna be much. Yeah, I, I, maybe half a degree at most, in my view, maybe somewhat less. So. Do we want to cut CO2 down with these draconian laws, lower our standard of living when our whole civilization has been based recently on carbon, on fossil fuel, energy generation and stuff? It's ridiculous, it's a regressive thing. We need to go on we're uh, expanding our economies and stuff just to have enough excess money around to look at alternate energy and stuff. So I think, I, of course we're gonna run out of uh, fossil fuel in time, maybe a few hundred years, 100 years, 50 or so, but we shouldn't be making choices now. In my view, there's a lot of pollution, a lot of environmental problems in the world, they're not gonna be solved by cutting uh, uh, CO2 down. We've got to work on those other problems and things. And let's leave for the next 40, 50, 60 years now, the people living then, let them make the choices and stuff. But we surely shouldn't do it now. It's not going to do any good. It's going to be regressive and lower the standard of living of us all. Now, what happened? I believe strongly in what I just said. What happened? Well, what happened was the ascendancy of the religion of numerical modeling and the loss of mere logical judgment in reality. That is what has happened. The modeling, people believe in modeling. And you see, the trouble was when I came along getting grants in Washington, all the people handing the grants out had usually been in a war and had been forecasters. They knew something about the weather and they knew 
you know, you had to look at data and stuff. So the people handing out the grants have, uh, you know, they've gradually retired and died, and a percent of them handing out has gone to nearly zero. And they've been replaced by people in the university trained only in models. The model, in our graduate department at CSU, we have about 90 graduate students, 75% are doing modeling work. We don't get synoptic class as much. They don't talk about the weather. We don't, it's, it's uh, they're living in a, in a different world. So the modeling people are handing out the money. And if I go in to look at data, they say, great, where's your modeling component? <laughs> you know, no, NOAA has passed laws that you can't get a grant unless there's a modeling component attached to your grant. And uh, of course, prediction of the weather is absolutely not possible with any skill beyond about two weeks or so. They, you, they start out initial value problems. That's a T equals zero. They have equations. They integrate these equations forward with time and they do a pretty good job. I'm very amazed since I got started before the numerical modeling got going in 55, I was a forecaster in the Air Force in a lot of places, and thank God I was, because I learned a lot, and uh, I suspected models from that point on. But anyways, they've done a great job. This is wonderful. I love the people predicting a week or two in advance that can verify their forecasts and study it and so on. But when you extend this further, you get into all these complications. The atmosphere is a can of worms on the climate scale. You've got to do all this stuff. I mean, who can write code for all these links and things back and forth, then integrate those are the seven or eight simultaneous equations they have forward with time, hundreds of thousands of time steps, and get anything but mush out. It can't be done, but they're doing it. They're doing it now. One of the things I said, see, we do forecasting. Our forecasting is empirical. We go before her, uh, we go look the last 50, 60 years before active hurricane seasons and inactive ones. And we usually find a little difference in the atmosphere and the ocean. It's an empirical signal. And we use that to forecast. We don't have to understand all the complicated physics and links. It's an empirical system that works, so we use it. So I claim we have culture, say. I claim the numerical people don't have culture. They don't look back in the past. And of course, the Greeks called people without culture barbarians. Yeah. So when I say, call the modelers barbarians, somehow they don't like me so much. I don't know why. Anyways, uh, here's what we have. Here's what is happening. They're all bowing down to the computer as if that's there. And what is happening, we're training a whole pile of people that live in a virtual world. NCAR, the National Center of Atmospheric Science, right up the hill here, uh, 30 miles. For many years, they never had a weather map hanging up. Then uh, they got embarrassed and they put one on the lunch counter or so. They do nothing in a practical sense. You tell them what, is it gonna be uh, a cold fall or next winter? They don't work on that. They work on higher level problems. And there's a whole group of us. See, in the, the real world, the forecasters of war, we trained a lot of forecasters and they dealt with the real world. At, they've sort of gone down with time. Whereas this virtual world people have been growing and they're supporting and they get grant money and global warming keeps them going because they're gonna tell us the answer. They'll never tell us the answer. They'll never get it. But they can convince the people in Washington who came out of modeling schools that modeling is the way to go. I used to get turned down for grants. that go, Gray, well, I know you're doing good work here and stuff, but the future rests with the model. 
And we've got to support these models. They don't do any good now, but in 10, 20 years, they're going to be running the world and doing great things. I've been waiting 50 years for that. <laughs> Anyways, here's my summary of the thing you see. You have the public is out here, and they want to know what real climate world is. This is a real climate, and they want to know what it is. Here's a reality barrier. And the modelers are going around in circles, <laughs> having publications. And yes, who do they send their uh, uh, proposals to? Other modelers who understand modeling. And they all are circling around downward to chaos and alarmism. That is the reality of the situation. I'm sorry. At my age now, I can tell the truth. And uh, I, I intend to do it. Now, uh, here's a nice book by Oren Pelkey and his daughter, Linda Pelkey Jarvis. And it's useless arithmetic. Why environmental scientists can't predict the future. You can't. It's not just meteorology, it's stream flow people, beach people, all kinds of people. The atmosphere in this system is too complex. Now a stream flow or a beach is certainly simpler than the whole atmosphere. And uh, yet they can't do that. This is a good book to uh, read. Anyways, uh, my general comment is, any scientist who would believe a climate model should have their head examined. I believe that strongly. Now, I like Michael Crichton. I feel very, uh, very bad that he had to die last fall at the age of 64. What a remarkable person he was, how he led the way with his novel and other essays. The best single essay I've ever read is by Michael Crichton titled, Aliens Cause Global Warming. If any, it's on the web somewhere. If you can get it, read it. It's marvelous. Anyways, the fascination with computer models is something I understand very well. This is what Crichton said. Richard uh, Fryman called it a disease. I fear he is right. Stepping back, I have to say, the arrogance of the model makers is breathtaking. I have found that so. When I was in graduate school, the, the pecking order went how good you were in mathematics and then how, if you modeled, you were a smart guy. If you looked at data like me, you, you, know, kind of, you just didn't have, have it up there. You weren't. Modeling was the future, the only way to go. And uh, there you have, you see, the modeler's brain is bigger than the empiricist brain. There's no question about it. But these guys can make better forecasts than those guys. And here's a typical uh, compo uh, modeler's composite of typical global warming skeptic. Now here's another one, another view of the uh, global warming skeptic model. However, note, he has hair on his chest. The modelers don't have any hair on chest. If they do, they, 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 um, they shave it off. Uh, anyways, so I've had a lot of this. We have, we've had a strong McCarthyism going. Are you now or I, have you ever been a member of any group or organization that denies the theory of man-made global warming? You're in trouble, you see, when you sell that the majority of people are out there. And I've had a lot of problems. I've, I, our forecasts, they were called, made to my dean and department head to shut Gray up or we're going to do it. And they, wouldn't, they weren't going to let us put our forecasts out under the university label and all this. Not because of our forecast, because I had a bad name. And... Uh, this is what's happening, but I'm making a long-range prediction. I won't be here to see it, but in 20 years, we will view Joe McCarthy in a more favorable light than we will Al Gore, I think. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, grants require peer review. You see, when you have a whole group of people out there, the power of the administrators to send a grant to people they know will turn it down or will grant it is there, big. And all these people living off these climate grants, here's a guy that doesn't believe in it. Well, damn it, you're taking food out of our mouth. I'm not gonna uh, grant you. Papers turned down, the editors of journals and stuff. And, uh, it, it's just terrible. I've been turned, I tried to, I've tried to publish a lot, number of papers. They just won't go, they won't take them. It's not in the mainstream. And uh, anyways, what's the cause of, now, okay. That's the first, how many hours do I have, Jane? <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, anyways, uh, what causes climate change? See, we need that, we need a mechanism to knock these CO2 guys out. We, there's no good mechanism, you see, and I have a mechanism. I think it, it's valid. It's the oceans. We have the oceans, this, that we have the flow of the Atlantic Ocean and deep sinking up here, the thermohaline circulation. We also have sinking of water around the Antarctic and there's upwelling in these various areas. And there are periods when this circulation goes stronger. When it does, the globe tends to cool, and you tend to have a little more rain. When it goes faster, the globe tends to warm, and we have a little less rain. And uh, I, that's my theory. Variations in global deep oceanic circulation are driven primarily by salinity variations. That's what is causing this glow ocean circulation to change. And look at the Atlantic. In the surface, the Atlantic is a very special ocean. It's high salinity. Why? Because it has more evaporation than precipitation. We have big high pressure cells here and we don't get as much rain as evaporation. Look at 500 meters down. The Atlantic is all by itself. And the Western Atlantic with very high salt content. Salt water weighs more than does fresh water. And uh, look at here, in the North Atlantic, the salt content goes up to very high latitudes, which it doesn't in the Southern Hemisphere except at selective areas around the Antarctic. If we look at the Antarctic, notice the South Pole is right here, very near these bays, the uh, uh, Weddell Sea and the Ross Sea here. And there are periods, we have these high mountains, you see, you have the high mountains in Antarctica and you develop these tremendous coal highs that exist over there and you have outflow of this very cold, dry air over the water. Sometimes it's frozen and the winds drive the, uh, drive the ice and things and you get tremendous evaporation in some of these special areas and you have water sinking. Here's sort of a shelf area. This is a cross section. Antarctica's here. There's one of these bays, a shelf area. You get these wind-driven open things called polinias, and you can get tremendous evaporation, and the water can have high salt content, be very dense, and sink down. So we have these two areas, the North Atlantic and around Antarctica, where we have sinking motion and upwelling in this general area here. And I sort of view it like this. The North Pole, the South Pole, equator, we have sinking here, we have sinking here, we have upwelling here. Now, when this circulation is stronger, this circulation is related to that. When this tends, North Atlantic tends to get strong, the South Atlantic tends to get strong. When we have this, we tend to have a little cooler water, and another thing, it tends to rain more. And those two things are, bring much more energy, take much more energy out of the system than uh, CO2 or any gases do. 
And there are periods when this circulation is weaker. We have less upwelling, less rain. That's my theory. Now, I'm sorry to say this, but I've thought long and hard. I don't. The solar activity has been looked at 100 years. It comes and goes. I'm sorry. I believe, Willie, the polar areas are maybe driven by solar effects, but the whole globe, there just isn't enough energy difference there. We did, the watts per square meter just aren't big enough. I, you know, I don't believe in cosmic rays. I mean, let, let them come and go, but I haven't seen anything uh, that nails that down. Aerosols, other factors. So I don't, although these other factors may affect things some, I'm not saying that they don't, but they won't explain the big century-long warming we've seen since around 1910. That century-long warming of 0.07 or 1 degree Fahrenheit is, uh, has got to be explained. Unless we explain that, the CO2 people will always claim CO2 with it. So that's what we got to do. Now, the trouble with this, everybody has their own view. If you're a, a radiation guy, the radiation does it. If you're an oceanographer, it's all ocean, but not, it's, it depends. We all see it. The only one who really sees it right is, of course, me. But uh, <laughs> there, are, uh, there are all these goons are feeling different part of the climate picture, and they only get part of it. It's only generalists who have no two brains too weak to become specialists who see all kind of things, and they come up with it. So, the thermohaline, there are periods when it's strong. There's more water going up and sinking and coming back at the deep levels. There are periods when there's less water coming up. And we diagnose it this way. Nobody measures the sinking, but we find when the sea surface temperatures are warmer here and the general pressure in the Atlantic is lower, that's when the thermohaline is stronger. That's when we tend to have global cooling. That's when hurri major hurricanes tend to be more active and so on. And you go back and you see that in back to 1870, there are periods when the North Atlantic was warmer than it was colder. This circulation was weaker than stronger than weaker. Now it's been stronger since 1995. And what you're talking about is having enough salinity in the water that it will sink. This is uh, the deep bottom water. This is uh, North Atlantic deep water formation. We've got to have density enough up here that when the water can sink and come down to deep layers. So uh, I, I don't have time to go over this, but in general we have the water sinking where it's very cold and coming up in uh, tropics where it's uh, the, the upper water is very warmer, so this is going to create a little warming. Perhaps three or four watts per square meter. The rainfall will be two or three watts per square meter, and we've got energy changes that are much beyond what CO2 can do. So I view global oceans, MOC, you're going to hear a lot of this in the future, meridional overturning circulation. It's made up of two components, the North Atlantic thermohaline circulation and the surrounding Antarctic subsidence. And you might view it like this. Here's when it's in neutral. The MOC is neutral. You have, this is units, Swerdrup units. I won't talk about those. This is a 15 Swerdrup, 10 Swerdrups you have rising about 25 square ups, which you got enough energy coming in from the sun that there's a balance here. Then when it's stronger, you might have 35 units going up and 15 units uh, going up when it's weak. And uh, there are various reasons why the North Atlantic causes circulation around here that is stronger and weaker and dictates more or less sinking around Antarctica. I won't go, 
When the meridian of circulation is stronger, we tend to have more blocking action. West Africa's wet, more major hurricanes, fewer El Ninos and uh, blocking patterns, more of a negative uh, PDO and the opposite here, and the westerlies are weaker here. When the other pattern is we have more El Ninos, fewer major hurricanes, stronger NAO westerly circulation, stronger westerlies here, and a whole lot of things that I don't have, of course, have time to talk about now. So I'll go forward, and um, another fact I want to talk about is uh, rainfall. In general, we're finding now, now this goes against the model's idea, when you get more evaporation, you have more condensation in the atmosphere. And most of this enhanced condensation is sent to space it doesn't necessarily warm. But what happens at the surface, more evaporation at the surface, takes more energy out of the surface, and the ocean and the surface tends to slightly cool. So if you get more rain, the globe tends to cool a little bit. You know, the rain around the globe, if you can believe any of the data, does vary a few percent more, plus or minus one or two percent higher or lower than normal. If you get less evaporation, less cooling, and less energy to space. So I, my idea of the, how the whole thing goes is we have Atlantic salt variations that causes thermohalion variations. This feeds in and causes Antarctic thing, and the whole thing changes the meridiano uh, ocean circulation, that causes global temperature change. CO2 is feeding in, but it's slight. And there's a proxy for this that I don't have time to talk about. It's the rotation of the Earth. There, they, they measure that in milliseconds, and that fits the ocean circulation in a rough way. I've done the math with it, and. And one of my idea for why the last century has warmed, because the MOC has been slower for a century in general, compared to what it was in the Little Ice Age. And I won't go in into this, but if you sink water at high latitude and rise it at lower latitude, the Earth tends to slow up a little bit and give angular momentum to the ocean. It does, I've worked the math out, I won't talk to you about it, but anyway, so what I see is explaining what has happened the last century is we've had a mean weakening of the MOC or the thermohalion. This has created a very on century scale gradual warming. But superimposed on that, we've had multi-decadal changes of the MOC of the thermohalin, and things have gone up and down with those. And uh, so I see it in the 19th century and the earlier, we had a stronger, generally stronger thermohalin circulation because the upper layers of the ocean had a little more salt. In the 19th century, this salt has gone down. This circulation over a century has been weaker. And although we've had the multi-decadal changes, they've gone up and down with it. And uh, there have been some talk of this. Uh, a broker and other people saw a major reduction in Southern Ocean deep water production during the 20th century from the high rates during the Little Ice Age is occurring. There's something I, uh, this is a much more appealing explanation to me than anything else. So there are, the, the ocean is such that the uh, deep ocean salinity is a little less than it is higher up, so general mixing like this of water coming up will reduce the upper level salinity. 
So if the thermo halo, or the MOC was going strong for a century or two, the general upper level ocean salinity might be going down a little bit and then set up a period when the, the, on a century scale this thing went slower. There have been some evidence for this. There have been some, uh, this woman, my daughter knows her, uh, uh, Henley, and she's been looking in the uh, Pacific at uh, salinity contents, and it appears like 17, 1800s, at least in the Pacific, the salinity was higher than it's been in the 20th century. So I come back to this. This is my idea of what happened. And uh, that's it. I have, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm not, huh? Uh, everyone can stay to midnight, right? <laughs> I got more to show. Anyways, the politics of global warming. This is what, of course, we know this, and thank God for the Heartland Institute stepping in. I want to thank God somebody came from other places and tried to balance this out. And um, this is private funding. Thank God for the NIPCC that Fred Singer talked about. That is a hell of a document. And I'm reviewing it. Of course, I don't agree with everything in it. But overall, I'm going to say it's a hell of a good document because I, we need something like that so badly. And um, this is reality. This is not reality here. And here's the document. And I, non-government uh, international panel of climate change. Uh, it's a long thing. How many pages is it? A thousand pages almost. It's a big thing. I don't, how'd you find people to write it? I, Craig Izzo and you must have done a marvelous job. Anyways, so I like, I, I'm just about done now. I've got a few things. We all remember Dwight Eisenhower, 61. Give a warning that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. He also said, Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocation, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. That is the summary of global warming. And I like, here, here's another one. Uh, this is Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Huxley. I got this out of an article. You have no notion of the intrigue that goes in this blessed world of science. Science is, I feared, no purer than any other region of human activity, though it should be. That's been my experience in my nearly 60 years in the business. It's, uh, it's uh, the morality is no higher than the car salesman, in my view. Uh, so, the right policy to address a non-problem is to have the courage to do nothing. I like Chris Moncton's statement. We should do nothing. And that bill before the Senate should fail and uh, let's hope some sense comes to the world with all the world's problems we have. Why get involved with this? This is 20th on the list or way down the road. We shouldn't be dealing with this. We should be dealing with other things that have meaning. Here's uh, some of mine. Now, these are people I've interacted with my pantheon of heroes, Fred Singer's at the top, Pat Michaels, Michael Crichton for his died, uh, Chris Moncton, uh, James Enhoff. What a great senator he has been to fight this. And then uh, Benny Peisel, Mark Moreno, you heard, 
Chris Horner, Bob Ferguson, all these people are great, are great and we should look and I have a final list of 10. I put him at the top, he needs a National Medal of Freedom or something for Fred Singer, because he's right there. And all these people now, there's a lot of others, I just put up 10 that I've interacted with, but there's a, a where this is, I feel so close to all these people. We have a common idea and a common purpose and we're trying to help the country by putting a monkey wrench in this runaway idea. So this is my final slide. If you, I, I have a, not a full, I'm trying to write all this up, but uh, there's a little bit I prepared for the New York uh, Heartland meeting in March. This is on my web page here, and the slides I've just shown you will be on the web page too for anyone who wants to see them. So thanks. I enjoyed talking to you. So, are there any questions? I'll be glad to take questions. I've got a quick one. Yeah. You mentioned uh, something about the CO2 and then uh, immediately. You mentioned CO2 and then immediately afterwards uh, water vapor, but uh, doesn't methane come in there before uh, CO2 after water vapor in terms of a driver? Uh, methane, in other words. Uh, I don't know enough about that. I can't say. Well, maybe other people here okay. do. Fred, is methane a, a tough? Methane is, is the second most important. Yeah, right. For genetic greenhouse gas. But it it's less than CO2, though, it's isn't less it? Than CO2, but these things are misleading because CO2 has a more dramatic dependence. Methane does not. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well. Maybe methane will come in, but if CO2 is very small, if methane is no worse than that, it's probably small too. Yes, I think we can take, we can take uh, some watts per square meter of human activity blocking energy to space and make it up in all the other energy processes that go on such that we won't see too much global warming. And of course, we'll probably see a little bit more rain. A little more uh, uh, rain in a uh, globe is probably beneficial. A little bit slightly warmer, probably beneficial too.